We're reconvening uh, the Committee on Energy and Climate, and we left off uh, with some uh, questions for Representative Long, and we'll start with Representative Baker's, well, Representative Baker. Representative Swazinski, can we take your question? Sounds good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just uh, kind of just a general uh, question on kind of process with this bill. We're kind of doing an informational, informational hearing on it. Um, are we going to bring this bill back and have an opportunity for amendments? And then, you know, um, you mentioned earlier in committee that uh, you may or may not uh, request a fiscal note on that on impacts on state local governments um, and just kind of how that process is going to play out and kind of just that's my first question. I have others. So, okay. Uh well, we will be bringing the back, uh, bill back for amendments. I don't know what date we're going to do that. We um, have a couple of things scheduled already. Uh, so we are, we have some things already queued up. So I, it won't be within a week. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and then, um, so... To Representative Long, Madam Chair, uh, just kind of just talked, it's been mentioned a couple times, uh, just kind of that things will be cheaper. I've seen a, a few publications talking about that each individual family might save between $1,200 to $1,600 um, if this bill is able to move forward. Um, you know, are you open to uh, putting that in writing uh, as a guarantee? Um, you know, we've seen... Uh, just from anecdotal uh, evidence in the last 10 years, um, kind of as it, this process has moved forward, almost a doubling or tripling in, in, in rates uh, across the country, in particular in the Midwest, um, and just kind of wanted to see, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of claims are being made from just a finance standpoint, and, and just kind of wanted to see what your openness uh, to, to amendments and support to, to kind of lock that in that, uh, to essentially would say that if things are to move forward to the next rate or whatever next level uh, that we would be able to just lock that in and guarantee that there is savings there across the board for businesses, industries, families. Um, I just wanted to see what your openness to that is. Um, thanks, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski. So the estimate I think you're citing on energy savings was from the report that uh, Mr. O'Connell presented. Uh, Six hundred to twelve hundred dollars a year was was what they estimated in savings, um, assuming a ninety one percent renewable energy and at, at uh, twenty fifty. So that's um, their estimate. The um, I think estimates that the utilities are putting out from their uh, complying with the current renewable energy standard. Some are uh, have reported saving money under the current standard. Some have reported that it's cost. Uh, a little bit depends on the on the utility, um, but none of them are reporting significant price impact. And this is looking retrospectively, so prices have come down considerably since, uh, in, in terms of wind uh, power in particular, and solar as well. Um, one thing I'll note is that when people mean different things when they talk about price, often they're, I assume you're talking about the rates that customers are paying. Um, so if you're looking at, at customer rates, that doesn't include some other things they may be paying elsewhere. So health care bills, taxes for being able to, uh, you know, take care of transportation infrastructure that was damaged by a storm or things like that. So there is, a, I think, a broader cost picture, too, when you're talking about the overall impact of climate that may not necessarily be taken into rates. Um, estimates are that renewables are going to save money, that they will continue to be cheaper over time. The, uh, but to answer your question specifically, the bill uh, doesn't change the language that is currently in the renewable energy standard where the PUC is specifically authorized to take into account the impact on ratepayers, and there is an ability for utilities and others to petition the PUC to make, to modify the uh, input, uh, application of the renewable energy standard if there is a significant impact on rates. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Long, are you aware of uh, any times in the history of the POC where they've maybe modified the renewable energy standard uh, because of raising uh, energy rates to customers? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, that, that has not been requested of the PUC to my knowledge. Uh, I will note that our rates in Minnesota are, are very competitive. We're the third cheapest in the Midwest in terms of price for uh, actual customers. and. 
over the impl implementation of the um, renewable energy standard that uh, has actually, we've actually gotten more competitive than a lot of our uh, Midwestern states in terms of the uh, cost to customers. So I think we've seen that renewable energy can work well for customers and I think that's why you've seen folks like Xcel Energy make a commitment to going to 100% and uh, folks like Great River Energy make commitments to going to 50%. Uh, Madam Chair, just in just kind of you know we've talked a little bit about kind of that advancement as we move through the future um, and how XL is doing what they're doing and, and other uh, folks are doing that. Uh, it was brought up, uh, I think, uh, last week uh, about a member saying they could cut in half what a, a local utility was potentially going to be paying uh, from an outside vendor uh, for uh, their electricity. And you know, I simply brought up. I don't think you necessarily need a mandate to do that. You maybe need a better sales staff. And you know, are you open up to maybe making this a goal rather than a mandate, or do you feel that that's the only way that this goal could be moved forward? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Zinsky, I think that the business as usual case that was modeled by the McKnight Foundation report, which is essentially no action, um, they found that we do make reductions in in terms of uh, climate impact in the short term, but by 2030. Natural gas has essentially replaced uh, most of the coal plants and a lot of the other utility, a lot of the other generation. And natural gas, while more carbon uh, friendly than coal, it's about 50% less, still has a, a big carbon impact. And so uh, there would not be significant carbon reductions after 2030 on a business as usual model. And so that's, um, I believe, one of the reasons why we do need a standard to help continue to push forward on uh, renewable energy and to make sure we're doing it in the time frame that the scientists are telling us is necessary. Madam Chair, Representative Long, um, from a natural gas perspective, um, obviously that's going to take up a larger portion. Um, are you aware of how much more frac sand mining in North Dakota are going to have to be done in order to meet that natural gas uh, need? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, I'm, I'm not uh, sure. I don't have any information personally about uh, the needs for frac sand mining. Um, I do know that the um, renewable energy, if you look at the Lazard uh, estimates that I mentioned this morning, um, wind and solar are cheaper than natural gas right now. And one other thing I mentioned on the natural gas side is that if you're looking at carbon uh, impacts, we're often only looking at the burning side when we're talking about coal versus natural gas, but there's some real um, open questions on research in terms of fugitive emissions from the pipe from the uh, pipeline process and as well as from the drilling process. And since natural gas is methane, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so even a small percentage of fugitive emissions could have a, um, a very large impact on the climate side. And estimates that I've seen are that two to three percent fugitive emissions and you basically wipe out any gains that natural gas has over coal in terms of uh, climate impact. So that's a, a real concern I have with the move to natural gas as well. And then just a, a final uh, answer or question uh, to you, Representative. Um, so if this bill passes, um, what will be the impact from an international basis on temperature? How much less will it be? So that's a, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, that's a great question. I think that's something that we could uh, model and would be worth asking to model. I think part of it is that's a collective action problem challenge with any uh, with any large uh, challenge is if one person acts and nobody else does, what's the impact of one person acting? But I think in this instance, we as a state by showing leadership can inspire other states to show leadership. We can help push uh, clean energy technology forward in a way that can help other states uh, develop these technologies as well. And I think we've seen other countries model some of the uh, work that the United States has done and so often have been able to jump over uh, some of the stages of energy development that we've had in this country of uh, having coal or natural gas and going straight to uh, solar or, or wind economy when you're able to get that um, those levels of affordability up. So uh, I, I guess I'm an optimist in saying that uh, we have to do something. I feel like this is important to do. It also has other benefits besides uh, having impact on the climate in terms of uh, health, in terms of jobs. But just speaking about climate specifically, I think that uh, being a leader matters. I think that Minnesota has been a leader in, in clean energy in the past. And if we're a leader now, then I believe that 
we can inspire other states to act and that can have an impact around the globe. Representative McKelland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative um, Long, excuse me. You talk about 100% fossil fuel free. Uh, between 2023 and 2026, Circle will be closing down two of its coal plants, and then they're supposed to be putting on a gas fired plant, natural gas. Does this, will this negate the natural gas fire uh, electric plant? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mecklen, the uh, natural gas plant would not count as uh, carbon free under the, the final step, which is the 2050 for most utilities or 2045 for Excel. Madam Chair, um, thank you. So, do, do you have an idea? So, if it's, would it still be built currently under what, you're, the, what you are proposing here? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mecklen, I think that's a, a good question for Excel. They have proposed a carbon free uh, standard for 2052, which is not too far from the timeline that, uh, that uh, this bill is proposing. This bill is 2045, so it's five years uh, earlier for Excel. But um, uh, you know, the utility has a relatively similar time frame in terms of trying to achieve carbon free with its own uh, per energy mix. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Long, so do you have in this bill any, um, anything to compensate the local business, local jobs, the, between the tax revenue that'll be lost as well as all these very uh, strong paying union jobs? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mecklen, there is in the uh, local benefits section um, new language, which is a specific instruction to the commission to um, implement the statute in a way that creates high quality Minnesota jobs um, and that also uh, takes into account the impact on local communities that are transitioning away from fossil fuel energy. Um, I'd be happy to work with you if you would be interested in, in uh, trying to make this language uh, more fleshed out or come up with uh, ways to help communities in transition. I think that that's a, a real concern that I share and, and would uh, be very open to figuring out different, different uh, ways to approach that going forward. I think when you're changing from one technology to another, we need to take into account the impact that's having on, on real people and their jobs, and, and so that's... Uh, something I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to. One more. Um, an another issue that <clears throat> we have in rural Minnesota is, I actually worked on a property not that long ago, year before last, we're required to have dual fuel. So if, if, if you have propane, for example, you have to have an electric source of heat, or if you're electric, you have to have some form of gas heat or something. And, and I don't see in here, um, how would that look in, in this plan going forward that we would have two forms of heat in the event one was lost? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mecklen, are you, are you talking about on the uh, home heating side or on the electric generation side? Um, both really, because if, if electric is one of your sor <laughs> sources, but if, if, if the long-term goal is to be fossil free, I mean, that's what I'm understanding. So, um, and, and, and there was even testimony today, I believe about eliminating gas stoves, gas water heaters, and such. So if we only have one source going forward because the rest of them don't fit into the carbon free, how do we address having uh, more? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mecklen, I'm, I'm not familiar with the dual fuel requirement on utilities. If, if there is one, I'd, I'd like to know more about it. If you're talking about requirements for uh, individuals, this bill doesn't touch the home heating uh, side in terms of natural gas use or propane use. You did mention that uh, our, uh, uh, the report that we heard earlier today talks about the transition over time um, that uh, would make um, clean energy even more feasible in terms of having a higher adoption of uh, home electric use. And um, so I think that would, as that's happening, that seems like a good conversation to have about how that would impact uh, individuals and how that might play out. This bill doesn't um, uh, require, have any requirements in that space in particular, but I'd certainly be open to talking more about how um, a increase in beneficial electrification would, um, would interact with dual fuel standards. Thank you. Members, are there other questions for Representative Long? I see no other questions, Representative Long. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Representative Bo. That's all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to give others a chance before this side of the table jumped in with more questions, but since okay. someone else did, I, will, I have a couple of them. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Long, uh, as an environmental professional, I, I do believe that re renewable energy will have to be a part of our toolbox, so I you know, applaud the efforts here. But as a former board member for a municipal utility, I have some concerns about mandates and, and what I have found over the years in that position was that mandates tend to cause costs to rise because when a mandate's out there, the suppliers of the services or the materials or the, the equipment know that there's a mandate there and they know that they can charge more, so they frequently do. So then the utilities end up having to pay a much higher cost to meet that mandate and that means that by default, the, the ratepayers all end up paying more as well. So rather than a mandate, I would rather see market pressures. I think that's a better driver for behaviors. And as I look at our utilities, they're well ahead of their goals now. So I would like to see those mandates or the market pressures really drive that. And therefore, the residents you know, don't have to pay that increased cost that a mandate can bring. And so rather than a question, that's a thought, and I'm curious your thoughts as to that, and then I do have one follow-up item as well. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Bowe, I appreciate your comment. Um, my main interest is in achieving the greenhouse gas goals that we've set as a state. I think that if we left that up to uh, the market as it is now, we're not going to come close. We, um, our projections that we heard from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency are that uh, we're not on track to, to reach our goals, um, and we've failed to miss our goals to date, even though we achieved our renewable energy standard goals to date. So uh, we have also know that the utility sector is likely going to have to overperform uh, some of the other sectors in order to meet our goals because of the um, difficulty of making reductions in the agriculture sector, the industrial sector. So um, I, I think that there is a role for uh, incentives. There is a role for policies that, that help uh, encourage. There have been proposals out there for um, using market forces like uh, putting putting fees on the price of carbon as, as one alternative. Uh, to my mind, having a renewable energy standard is something that Minnesota knows how to do. It's something we understand. And I think that if you have a long uh, time horizon like uh, 2050, uh, we're, we're planning towards it, you know, a generation and a half away, that we can deal with some of the um, uh, predictability issues and, and people will know we are going to have to move towards uh, renewable energy over time. And um, I think one of the differences too between now and when we uh, had our previous renewable energy standard is that um, costs have come way down for uh, wind and solar in particular. And so um, I think that the impact will be significantly less in terms of um, the price that you're seeing. And we, we did see that uh, rate impacts were, were not large for uh, our utilities from the current renewable energy standard. In some cases, we're negative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, something which is another concern, and that is the utilities have had success. And unfortunately, the tendency is to go back to where we've had success. And, and so in, in a way, the utilities are actually being penalized because they've had success. So we're going to go back to that same well and ask more from those utility companies because they have done well, whereas other sectors have not done so well. And there's a danger of going back to the same well over and over again as you run the well dry after a while. So that's a concern. Second thought is, you know, regarding, uh, I think it's section 1.5 is what we would refer to it as. I know uh, as a solid waste professional, I've seen the state for quite some time having efforts to promote increased processing of solid waste. And as a result, many counties have uh, invested a large sum of money and a large amount of, of time and effort into that area. And now we're looking at really pulling the rug out from under uh, solid waste uh, energy, uh, burning solid waste and processing solid waste for energy production. And that concerns me just because a lot of counties have spent a lot of money and now we're in effect, you know, pulling the rug out from under them right in the middle of that whole process. That's a concern as well, I think, and it, it, I think it undermines trust in the system because if you've taken that uh, challenge seriously and, and gone forward on good faith and then now this suddenly we change uh, horses in the middle of the stream, that makes it 
tough to get folks at the county level to come on board again at some point in the future. So, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bo, to your to your first question, I think that when you're looking at the um, reductions that have to be made across the economy, I think it makes sense for us as a committee to focus on those that are most cost effective and most achievable and those uh, happen to be in the utility sector at the moment. Um, transportation is one that uh, there's a lot of cost effective gains to be had too as well as industrial efficiency but agriculture is very hard to, to come by uh, uh, solutions that are as cost effective as, as uh, working in the public utility sector. So uh, in some ways that is uh, it may be viewed as unfair, it may be viewed as an opportunity I think for uh, the utility sector. They're, um, right now, uh, as I mentioned in my, my remarks this morning, most of our investment in the electric sector is going out of state, uh, mostly going to buy fossil fuels from other states. And so if we're able to actually bring back that investment to Minnesota, then we can uh, create significantly more jobs. Uh, 50,000 was the projection from Ignite in, uh, in terms of solar and wind jobs alone. So I think that is a, a real opportunity that uh, utilities and us as a state can look at. On the waste energy question, um, the, you know, this bill isn't, doesn't prohibit that form of uh, uh, energy production. It's something that the, you know, utility that, uh, that can be used by counties and others for waste management purposes or for um, producing steam or other purposes. But the purpose of this act is to really focus on, on the greenhouse gas and carbon impact. And unfortunately, uh, waste energy does have a carbon impact. And so it didn't, uh, I don't think, make sense to keep uh, waste energy in a bill that was seeking to have a, a zero carbon uh, goal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Swazinski, did you have another question? Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, does nuclear, this is to Representative uh, Long, uh, does nuclear power count as carbon free energy? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, yes, it does. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, does uh, large-scale hydro count as, as uh, carbon-free energy. Um, rep, uh, so Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, uh, this bill doesn't specify. It would be up to the Public Utilities Commission to determine, but there, from my perspective, it, there's nothing in this bill that would prohibit uh, that being viewed as a carbon-free resource. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, represent, would you support uh, a change in law so that that would be considered uh, part of carbon-free energy? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, I'm I'm very open to conversations about about hydro. I think that hydro is an important part of uh, of clean energy, um, and so that's something I'd be open to having more conversations about. Is that a yes? I'm not going to uh, you know negotiate uh, uh, the bill. I think at this point, I'd be open to having conversations with utilities and others about different um, paths to get to 100. Uh, percent But I think that hydro is uh, been used as a clean power for a long time. And I, there are concerns, I think, that were intended to get at with the original bill about new hydro and uh, especially new large hydro and the impacts that that can have on, on uh, ecosystems. Um, but I think there are some, some nuance to be had in the hydro discussion. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, just coming up with a few more here. Um, um, so let's just say, because you know, obviously the technology doesn't exist for this to be a possibility. Uh, right now as a bill. Um, let's say that coal, we, become, we come up with a new technology that captures 100% of the carbon uh, out of a coal-fired plant. Would you support that? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, so if you're talking about carbon capture uh, technology, the, I think that would be up to the uh, Public Utilities Commission to determine if that meets uh, the definition of not emitting carbon dioxide. If, the Public Utilities Commission determined that, then it would be a, a part of the regular process before the Public Utilities Commission to uh, assess whether that's a good deal for ratepayers. My, my guess is that it, it won't be. My guess is that uh, renewable energy is going to be uh, much cheaper for the foreseeable future than carbon capture. There's been efforts around the country to develop carbon capture, and to date they've been uh, prohibitively expensive. Um, and just uh, kind of just one more uh, Madam Chair, Representative, are you aware how many acres um, to create a certain amount of solar? I mean, I know Excel's done about 22,000 acres or is on the process of doing that in solar. 
um, and just what this would potentially mean for more land potentially being taken out of production. Do you have a rough estimate on what that would potentially mean to, to land use and across the state? Uh, Madam Chair Representative, I don't have an acreage estimate uh, on hand. Um, I do know that there are a lot of farmers who are, who are very eager to participate in solar energy and see it as a good way to diversify, have different sources of income uh, compared to uh, the other crops that they're producing. And I'll just end with, a, you know, I think as we take more and more acres out of uh, production here in the U.S., uh, we talked a lot about, you know, are we just exporting our dirty to someplace else? You know, every acre we take out of the U.S. is probably an acre of rainforest being cut down in Brazil. So, Are there other questions, members? I don't see any. Thank you, Representative Long. We are going to now... Uh, begin with a public testimony uh, and we have first Juari Jama <coughs> and after that Eric Passi Thank you for coming. Would you say your name for the record? Juaria Jama. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, my name is Juaria Jama, and I'm a 15-year-old freshman at Spring Lake Park High School. I represent Congressional District 5 on the Minnesota Youth Council, and I'm speaking today as a member of MN Can't Wait. MN Can't Wait is a youth-led climate change organization that are fighting for effective climate change solutions before it's too late. The first time I went camping was last summer when I was 14. I went to Camp Bovee in Wisconsin for two weeks. That was one of the best experiences of my life. At camp, we learned life skills like how to identify plants, canoe across the lake, set our own fire, and make our own food. We even had our own Camp Olympics and got to compete in things we learned there. Thinking back now about that experience, my little sister is the first person that comes to mind. She's going to turn two in April, and in a decade when she's my age, I'm not sure if she'll be able to have the same experiences that I've had. Climate change affects things like our hobbies and interests, but it's much more than that. Though I want my sister to experience things like camping, we have to make sure that our planet is safe enough for her to live a long, healthy life, one where her only worries are finishing her homework and not a climate crisis. Right now, my family lives in Heritage Park in North Minneapolis. Our neighborhood is predominantly African American and a place that has seen the effects of climate change. From my window, I can see the air pollution coming out of multiple factories going into our streets. For a while, I've never thought about the outcome, but studies conducted by the Minnesota Pollution Agency and the Minnesota Department of Health has shown that 1,000 plus people die every single year in the Twin Cities due to air pollution. These agencies have also stated that poor minority communities are more at risk for developing asthma and other health-related issues due to air pollution. If we don't fight back right now for 100% renewable energy in the next decade, I'm scared for my sister's childhood and the lives of many around us. Because I'm from a minority community, I understand what it's like to be left out of the conversation. I'm speaking up right now so that the next generation has a place to call home. We need 100% renewable energy and we need it now because MN cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, <coughs> Eric Passi. And after that, Cliff Kaler. And from just a reminder to folks that uh, testimony should be no more than two minutes. And we do have uh, a signal up here uh, for how you're doing. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. My name is Eric Posse. I'm the Chief Development Officer for IPS Solar. We're a local solar company based out of Roseville, Minnesota, and a Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association member. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for hearing this important testimony today. Since 2015, our company IPS has grown over 600%. And in 2013, we had three full-time employees. This year, we will support over 500 workers and contribute over $100 million in economic development in the state. We don't need to choose between the planet and the economy. We don't need to choose between low cost energy and clean air and water. Since I started in solar 12 years ago to today, solar panels are 95% less expensive. 
and those cost declines are accelerating. Our projects are providing nearly $25 million in local taxes and wages in the state. And we're paying local farmers over $25 million with rates sometimes double or triple what they'd get for agriculture. Added to that, we're planting pollinator-friendly seed mix at all of our sites. We don't need to choose between the planet and the economy. Solar installer is the fastest growing job in Minnesota and the country. And solar beat out natural gas in head-to-head -head pricing in Minnesota in 2015. We do not need to choose between the planet and the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Cliff Kaler and next uh, on the list would be Kathleen Doran Norton. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Will Georgia with Novel Energy Solutions. I'm filling in for Cliff Kaler tonight. And um, Novel Energy is a local uh, Minnesota developer as well, uh, founded in 2012 in St. Charles, Minnesota. So we were founded by fifth generation farmers who've been in agriculture in Minnesota for over 130 years. Um, today we're in St. Charles as well as St. Paul and um, we've seen just a tremendous amount of growth in uh, jobs and energy savings for our customers. Um, so we started in agriculture. Most of our customer, customers are rural farmers who want to save money because their utility costs keep rising. Um, a lot of our customers are small businesses who also want to save money because their utility costs keep rising. So we're in the business of creating, offering our customers energy savings and making their bottom line work. And you know, in 2012, we started with three employees. Today, we're, over to, we're at just at 40 employees. And over the next year, uh, we see ourselves uh, at least doubling in the amount of people we're looking to hire. And if we, would, if we had a bill uh, like this one, we could see you know, even doubling that amount over the next few years. because those kind of policies create certainty around, um, around the technology and the need. And so for us, you know, that's, that's additional jobs just in our business. Um, that doesn't include what's in the supply chain, what we have in, in construction hires, um, and ultimately what gets saved by the local communities, the people who are using this electricity. So I want to urge you to support this bill, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen, uh, Dorton Norton, and after her, Thor Underdahl. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chair. Um, members of the committee, uh, I'm Kathleen Dora Norton from Bridgewater Township in Rice County. I've been a township supervisor for a dozen years, a member of Isaiah and St. Dominic's Catholic Church. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the bill. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, for inviting Minnesota scientists to talk about the impacts of climate change on Minnesota. Um, as I listened in my living room, um, I remember joking with uh, the township board about uh, how 100 years wasn't what it used to be. Um, but it also brought to mind standing in a road ditch, uh, looking at our truck with six inches of gravel underneath it and six feet of nothing underneath that. Um, or a, a twisted culvert that should have had 15 more years of life. Um, climate change means water, wind, and weeds. In the last couple of years, we've been dealing with invasive wild parsnip on our roadside and having to spend money on, on equipment and, and labor for, for that. For small communities, climate change is financial death by a thousand costs. Uh, Pope Francis, in his encyclical Laudato Si, urges us to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And a couple of years ago, we had a parish forum on energy and poverty, and I learned that low-income folks pay two to three times what the more fortunate among us pay. Um, this bill seems to have a one Minnesota approach. Uh, assuring that uh, no tribal member or Section 8 renter or a poor rural family is left behind. Uh, I'm excited to see this bill. Uh, I hope it passes the House and the Senate and Governor Walls signs it. 
that the benchmarks are, are passed earlier than required, and we do the thousand other things that we need to do to have 100% carbon emission free Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thor Underdahl, and then next, Vicki O'Day. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Thor Underdahl. I'm with Minnesota Power. Um, we are uh, officed out of Duluth, Minnesota. We're an investor-owned utility, and we serve about a 26,000 square mile service area um, from Duluth down to Little Falls, Long Prairie, all the way up to International Falls. I um, want to thank the author, first of all, for starting this important conversation. He's been very forthcoming and, and sitting down and, and having these discussions, and that's much appreciated, and this is a good starting point for that. You know, uh, as a utility that's been here for over 100 years, we really value the relationships we have with policymakers and helping to move Minnesota forward on uh, these energy initiatives, and we want to make sure we get the, the details right. Um, we're a very unique utility in that about 60% of our revenues come from 12 large industrial customers. So that's very unique to just Minnesota Power. Usually it's the flip of that, and it's mostly residential. So these are large taconite mines. These are paper mills. They're really the lifeblood of northeastern Minnesota. They're incredibly energy intensive, um, and so they feel the brunt of any price increases quickly. Um, and they trade uh, commodities that really don't have a, a premium price um, to be kind of absorbed like some other businesses do. So we're very sensitive to that, and we want to make sure that we consider those important entities in these discussions. You know, we were uh, uh, just uh, a little over 10 years ago a coal-based uh, utility that had 95% coal, and we've made significant strides to be over 30% renewables at this point, shooting towards 44% with a caveat that I'll mention in a section, a section uh, in just a second in 2025, um, and uh, with a carbon reduction of 40% by 2025, so well above um, our, our stated goals as a state. But what we're getting to right now is what our engineers like to refer to as the load-bearing walls of the electric system. And these are these really big, large generation um, um, pieces of the infrastructure that we're talking about taking off. Big transitions for the communities, really big transmissions for the systems, and we want to make sure we're having a robust and thoughtful conversation about that. In our next resource plan, we'll be digging into this and doing a baseload study and looking at these things very specific to us. What are the cost implications? Um, what are the, the constraints in different areas, and how can we most cost effectively do it? So we want to make sure we allow for the, that time as well, too. Um, and then I would, I would say thank you to Representative Swedzinski for bringing an uh, important point, point to light. Um, when we're talking about carbon reduction as the goal, we don't think we should take any tools off the table. For us, that's large hydro. Um, we have a 250 megawatt power purchase agreement that will start in 2020. It's a 12% of our overall portfolio. So ostensibly, if this bill were to pass, we would have to go 12% farther than every other utility similarly situated to us. So we feel that's a bit of an unfair advantage. Um, and then finally, just on the feasibility studies, we think these are important to consider, but each have their pros and cons. Everyone can set their assumptions how they would like to. So we want to consider a robust set of feasibility assessments, including those by MISO, the independent system operator, who's looking at their renewable in integration impact study and what that would mean for our system. Thanks for bringing this forward, Representative Long, and we look forward to the future discussion. Thank you. Uh, Vicki O'Day and next, Barb Draper. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Vicki O'Day. I am in 57A, Robert, uh, Representative Bierman's um, district, and I work for the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance, which is located in Bacchus, Minnesota, which is in north central Minnesota, rural Minnesota, and um, I'm the development director there. And REAL has been around since 2000, and our work is to make solar energy accessible to low-income people. Um, and so we've been fighting energy poverty since 2000 with solar thermal and solar electric um, technologies. And so um, the bill, the local benefits in the bill, thank you, Representative Long, are, are really important to us, as well as the, you know, the increments with the utilities to help us do our work and solve the problem of energy poverty in this country, which 43 million Americans are affected by. So that's my professional self. As a person, I'm a grandmother. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter. Her name is Amaya, and she um, is in the Woodbury. She goes to Spanish immersion school, and she is a very smart young woman. She stayed overnight at my house over the weekend, 
And we have been watching since my grandmother Edna died two years ago, we have been watching YouTube videos and going to museums to figure out what this thing about death is about, what makes civilizations rise and fall. This is a very critical conversation that we're having today for my granddaughter Amaya. And so I'm here representing her voice and the voices of grandmothers. I just want to say to you that I'm very grateful um, for this time and I want to read a poem that we wrote after my grandmother died about generations and ancestors. Ancestors are the non-living. Generations are the living. Before a baby is born, she is an ancestor and a future generation. Ancestors set the stage. Generations care for the stage. Generations honor the life that was and create the life that will be. Ancestors are the non-living and generations are the living. The we that we are hearing this now means we are the generation for now. Ancestors set the stage, generations care for the stage, Tell me then, how are we caring for the stage? Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, uh, Barb Draper and then Reverend Sarah Campbell. Barb Draper is not here. <coughs> Reverend Sarah Campbell. Uh, I. Committee members, I especially uh, welcome Reverend Campbell since she is my pastor. Thank you all for your work and this, this long day. You're still here. I am Sarah Campbell, senior minister at Mayflower Church in Minneapolis. I am a Minnesotan through and through, baptized in Moorhead, part of every summer of my life spent in the Northwoods College in St. Paul. I choose this state, what my colleagues call flyover land, because I love the four bold seasons. I'm a spouse, parent of two adult daughters, and now a grandmother. I have many loves. I love my people. I love my church. I love the children of my church. I love my religion, the stories, the spiritual practices, the Jesus path. But humanity is destroying God's creation. It's happening faster than we thought it would. I pray for the earth. I also pray for the souls of my people whom I love, especially for the children of my church. What is going on in the souls of our children when they hear what is really happening on the earth? This is a planetary crisis. It is also a crisis of meaning, of religion. It's pulling the rug out from underneath absolutely everything. And here is the damnedest and the most hopeful thing about this, the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. We have everything we need to fix it. Everything. It's like having a spreading cancer and knowing that the treatment is available. 10 years ago, some of us were in the upper room at Mayflower despairing about the earth, and then someone said, what's our plan? So how are we as a church going to become carbon neutral? We made our building more efficient, installed 200 solar panels. We're still working our plan. And in the striving, we are joyful and hopeful. I need to skip ahead. I'm going to go to this spot. My most sacred place on this earth is on the high banks of Leech Lake. And I've been going there since I was a baby. In August, I held my granddaughter, three months old, and we listened to the loons calling out. And when she's 20 and I'm almost 80, I hope to listen to the loons with her still. And maybe after she'll say to me, Nona, did you know that we almost lost all this? I was learning in my history class about how it all turned in one year. It all turned. It was called the Green New Deal. They did this thing in Minnesota and in other states too. 100% clean energy and it transformed the whole state economy, bringing opportunities for people who didn't have them before. Did you know this Nona? And I'll smile and I will say, oh sweetie, I met the most wonderful people in that movement all different kinds of people, and we were strong and smart and hopeful. 
Here we are, February 5th, 2019, Minnesota. It all begins today. And someday, you can all tell your grandchild that you were there when it all began. Thank you. Nick Baker, and after that, Kelsey Johnson. Madam Chairperson, Representatives, my name is Nick Baker. I'm representing the Sierra Club. I would like to tell you about a conversation I had with the 19-year-old University of Minnesota <coughs> student. We were discussing climate change, and at one point she looked at me wistfully and said, you know, in a way your people your age are really lucky. You'll probably be dead before it gets really bad. This is a step towards proving her wrong, please. Kelsey Johnson, and then Kevin Corredo. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the, uh, this committee. My name is Kelsey Johnson. I'm president of the Iron Mining Association of Minnesota. Our association represents six operating iron mines and two idled pig, uh, pig iron facilities in northeastern Minnesota. The iron mines directly employ 4,500 people, and the vendor member community that supports these facilities employ another 11,500 hardworking men and women. These are high-paying, high-skilled jobs. The iron mining industry workers earn between $85,000 and $100,000 a year and are active members of their communities. Environmental stewardship is a core value of Minnesota's iron mines, and the iron mines have, ha have made significant changes to their processes and facilities to honor their agreement with the state and communities where they operate. American iron mining and steel making companies are regularly awarded for environmental stewardship awards for their work to become a more responsible industry. Minnesota's iron mines provide 85% of the nation's iron, which is used to make the steel that, we, that makes the things that we use every day. For example, building a wind turbine requires between 200 and 400 tons of steel. As a strategic partner, the iron mines would like to continue to provide the nation with the iron it needs to make the steel for the green revolution of the future. The Iron Mining Association firmly believes that these American iron mines operate safer and more responsibly than anywhere else in the world. This could not be made more clear than when looking at a map of greenhouse gas emissions by country. You can do that by, by visiting www.waqi.info, a world air quality index map. Iron mines are the single largest consumer of energy in Minnesota. The iron mining facilities run 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Over the last 10 years, the iron mines in Northeast Minnesota have seen a 60% increase in their energy rates. These increases are not sustainable. Each iron mine is competing globally for the same customer base. The iron mines are greatly affected by global price, pricing fluctuations and changes, as was seen in 2015 when seven facilities idled due to illegal steel dumping. That same year, the state legislature acknowledged the, different, the difficult circumstances faced by the iron mining industry and other affected industries and passed energy-intensive trade-exposed legislation to help alleviate some of the massive increases. In September 2017, the Public Utilities Commission further recognized and supported energy-intensive trade-exposed reductions to large power users. The adoption of 25 by 25 renewable energy standard was one of the factors that has driven this considerable cost increase to the iron mines. As new regulations or increased renewable energy standards are adopted, the iron mines become less co cost competitive and thereby less likely to be able to keep their facilities open. Any curtailment or idling of these facilities comes at a tremendous cost to our environment as other countries ramp up their less responsible iron mining. As Minnesota embarks on a green energy revolution, two things must be acknowledged. First, that revolution can't happen without the raw materials like iron ore to build the infrastructure. The second is a green energy revolution can't be truly green if it is built with raw materials mined in nations without environmental regulations. In order to ensure this green revolution is built with responsibly sourced infrastructure, we'd recommend a cap on the increases to energy intensive trade exposed industries like ours, as was done in Illinois for their 2017 Future Energy Jobs Act. Germany took a similar approach in protecting important industries in its approach to carbon reduction and renewable energy promotion. 
Minnesota can and should do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Corredo, and next up, Delaney Russell. My name is Kevin Corrado. This love letter that I'm going to read to you will make more sense if you realize that my two-year-old granddaughter currently calls me Baba. It's dated February 14th, 2030. Dear Baba, it feels strange writing a Valentine's letter to you. When you died in 2028, just past your 78th birthday, I thought I would never be able to communicate with you ever again. Somehow, writing a letter seems like a special way to connect my thoughts to your spiritual energy. I want to send you my gratitude and love for trying to make this a better world for me, my cousins, and for future generations. Also, I want to especially thank those women and men who were in the Minnesota legislature in 2019. You told me that many legislators truly cared about present and future residents of the whole state. If I remember correctly, you said that a bill was passed later in that year to establish state standards for all utilities to use renewable and non-carbon sources for the generation of electricity by the year 2040, or maybe it was 2050. I think you called it the 100% clean energy bill. Sadly, now in 2030, recent global and local reports are saying we need to accelerate the transition to 100% clean energy sources. Oh. I just want to let you know that mom, dad, and I went to a rally at the Capitol last Saturday to support more funding for the Minnesota Climate Refugee Fund. I don't think you had that in 2019. We're one of the families in our neighborhood sponsoring a climate refugee family from Florida. Baba, I miss you. I wish you were to tell we here to tell me more stories about how the 2019 100% Clean Energy Bill was a turning point for my future and for all of Minnesota and beyond. I can assure you that many other states have been inspired by the compassion and courage of Minnesota climate activists and bold political leaders. Happy Valentine's Day, wherever your spirit may be, with tons of carbon-free love, Sydney. Delaney Russell and then Kent Solom. I just want to cry listening to that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Long, and members of the Energy Committee for this opportunity to speak. My name is Delaney Russell, and I have three points. First, I want to start by thanking Representative Long, Senator Friends, and the 32 co-authors of the Pathway to 100% legislation. It takes a lot of work to do this, skillful, behind the scenes, and unrecognized. I want to publicly show my appreciation. Second, democracy depends in part on showing up, and I want to stand with those promoting a stable climate and sustainable economy with related living wage jobs. Individual actions on this can go only so far. Only our government can strategically align the activities of the community as a whole so that 100% renewable energy is consumed by all not just by those of us with the resources to research and buy into this or that solar garden. Yes, there are valid concerns, and we've heard some today, but I'd offer that they are less than the concerns of the alternatives and that we can address them. Finally, I'm here because our government's fundamental role is to promote the general welfare, regardless of who shows up. As a legal aid attorney, I want to point out that not everyone has the capacity to show up at hearings like this. So many people would lose their jobs if they took time off of work, or they might lack daycare or transportation. My experience is that people living in poverty want the best for our children, for their children, as much as any of us in this room. I appreciate that this proposal considers the needs of all in our community and aligns the electric consumption of all in our community. Thank you again for going the extra mile, for overcoming momentum, and for promoting general welfare. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kent Solom and then Rob Scott Hopland.
Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ken Sulem. I'm with the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. And we're here today not to oppose the bill, not to argue facts here and there, but to say if we're going to be leaders, we need to make sure we're leaders in the right direction, doing things the right way. Passing a mandate can be an easy thing for a legislature to do. Making it happen, actually being able to achieve that goal is another matter. And frankly, right now, I don't think we have all the answers we need from the utility side to answer your questions. We need to have more information as to what exactly will it take to get to this goal, what transmission lines are needed, what costs are going to be incurred, what are the secondary impacts. Um, I think it was Representative Mahoney this morning said that this issue isn't in a vacuum. Uh, there's cross issues that happen, as was mentioned in the questions earlier. Uh, we are seeing uh, thousands and thousands of acres of tillable land uh, coming off the uh, production line not so much as a balancing of crops, but simply because it's a price that is far better than any crop you'll have right now. And we see that a lot when I worked with the townships for almost 18 years. We were constantly dealing with those farming practices that were changing and the impacts that we had on that community. So what we would propose and what our association stance has been is that we have a study that would be a comprehensive review of all the steps that are required to get to this objective, realizing that this uh, is a goal that's a laudable goal but in the bill, it's a mandate that falls on us without a clear platform of how we're supposed to get there, how we're supposed to pay for it, what the secondary impacts might be. And so that's simply our request uh, that we have the proper study done by a neutral group, perhaps MISO, perhaps the uh, NERC, uh, an entity that understands all the regulations we have to play by um, at both the state and federal levels uh, and those types of things. So we can do this the right way. Because if we can't afford to uh, not do anything, we can't afford to do it wrong. Thank you. Bob Scott Hovland and then Stuart Henry. Good afternoon or maybe good evening. It's kind of drifting into that. Uh, Representative Wagenius and members of the committee, I want to thank you for allowing me to testify on House, Fly, House File 700 today. I represent Missouri River Energy Services. We're a municipal power agency that provides wholesale electricity and other services to 61 municipal electrics in four states. 25 of our members are located here in Minnesota, basically on the western edge of Minnesota. Missouri River and its members are all not-for-profit, we're customer-owned, and we're customer-controlled. And to date, we are on track to meet the renewable energy standard with a variety of resources, including wind, solar, and hydroelectric. Missouri River Energy Services is not opposed to adding more renewable energy. We are opposed to the steepness of the curve, uh, steepness to the curve in increasing uh, that standard. With such a steep rise in a relatively short period of time, it may not be possible to get all of the generation and transmission in place to meet that new goal. As an example, Missouri River Energy Services is in the process of constructing a small hydroelectric facility in a small flood control dam down by uh, Des Moines, Iowa. This resource will generate about 36.4 megawatts of electricity, or enough electricity to serve the needs of about 18,000 homes. Despite the strong support from the local community and from the state, the permitting process alone took us 10 years. And beginning to end, the project will have taken about 16 years. And we expect that, barring any really delays, we expect that facility to be commercially available for us in 2020. That project will provide our members with basically a baseload renewable energy resource. That means when the sun is not shining, the wind is not blowing, it'll still be capable of producing electricity because the river will still be flowing. Renewable energy will always be a part of our portfolio and resource mix. But to promote reliability, we need a diverse portfolio of energy resources to keep the lights on and to keep the furnaces running. Our, our project, our Red Rock Hydroelectric Project is a reminder that we need time to build robust generation and transmission and to keep, primary, keep reliability as our primary focus. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to working with you again. Uh, 
Stuart Henry and then John Brecky. Hi, thank you for uh, letting me testify today. My name is Stuart Henry, and I'm speaking today as a homeowner in support of this bill. Uh, based on my experience working to electrify everything in our home, I believe a 100% renewable electric si electricity system will create numerous jobs in traditional building trades. My wife and I pay for wind source renewable energy from Excel. We have made three major purchases in our journey to electrify everything. We bought a used, used Nissan Leaf for $13,000 after trade-in. We replaced our gas clothes dryer for an electric one and our gas water heater, heater for an electric heat pump water heater. Because of the bigger load on our electrical system, we're advised to increase our home's current from 100 amps to 200 amps. We also needed to install several 220 volt plugs. Finally, we decided to separate our garage electricity for our homes from our home's electricity so that we could take, take advantage of cheaper electricity rates for nighttime car charging. We spent $6,000 on an electrician, some more money to Excel and around $38 hundred dollars to an HAV, HVAC installer for the heat pump water heater. Now, we are just one household, but even if a small percentage of households in Minnesota choose, are incentivized, or mandated to electrify everything, there will be millions spent on traditional building trades such as electricians and HVAC installers. A move to 100% renewable energy is good for our health, our future, and our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Brecky and then Christopher Schoenher. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Brecky. I'm with Great River Energy. We are a generation and transmission cooperative serving 28 distribution retail cooperatives spread throughout the state of Minnesota. We are supportive of the state's carbon and energy goals and we are opposed to this legislation in its present form. Utilities are taking voluntary action. In our case, we are down 38% on carbon emissions since 2005. That's a, redu a reduction trajectory that's not required by law. And additionally, in 2018, we voluntarily set a 50% renewable energy by 2030 goal, and we went ahead and met the state's mandate for 25% renewable energy eight years before it was required. That's happening without a law. It's our member consumers taking action through their elected boards. Indeed, we are the one sector of the economy that's tracking with the state carbon reduction goals. We are aware of the state's 80% carbon reduction goal by 2050, and we realize what's expected of us. We take it seriously and we have a built-in incentive to meet it because of electrification opportunities that have been mentioned. This legislation is unnecessary, and it risks making the transition more expensive for consumers because it changes the market power dynamic of renewable energy projects. Developers can charge us more when they know we are bound by law, and those costs get passed on to Minnesota consumers. Finally, and very importantly, the requirement of 100% by 2050 versus 80% under current law, that choice needs to be revisited for two reasons. One, the cheapest reductions are the first reductions under the law of diminishing marginal returns. And the last 20% are the most expensive. A cost benefit study of the specific difference between an 80% reduction and a 100% reduction should be undertaken. Secondly, we are part of a market and we have uh, uh, power plants from other states that affect our market, that are sold into our market, and we cannot control the flow of the power between state lines. Some of those plants will benefit from this law affecting Minnesota peaking plants and forcing a shutdown locally so that plants in other states can run and emit the CO2. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Schoenher, and after that, Rick Evans. 
Madam Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, before you this evening. Uh, I'm Chris Shane here from Southern Minnesota Municipal Power Agency. We are the wholesale energy provider to 18 municipal utilities scattered across Minnesota. Our member communities and the people who live there are much like all Minnesotans. They care about the environment, they care about and are supportive of renewable energy, but at the same time, they expect us to balance that with providing continued reliability and affordability of that energy. That's our job, and we take that responsibility very seriously. A balanced generation portfolio is very important. Uh, we learned that repeatedly on the warmest and the coldest days of the year. We talked about the polar vortex this morning. I'd like to talk instead about uh, when we met our, hit our peak demand this past July, um, and everything worked the way it was supposed to. Our wind generation performed very well, and as is typically the case, as you get towards the, the middle part of the morning, it starts to taper off. But as the sun comes up, our solar generation started to come on. Uh, but in between there, the clouds come across, and it'll, they'll bring the solar generation down from time to time. But when that happens, we have natural gas engines that can ramp up really quickly and ramp back down very quickly that fill in those gaps. With that, that's the way it was designed to work. It's kind of nice when that actually happens and things work out well. Um, Right now, we don't currently have a commercially available carbon-free generation technology that could play that fill-in-the-gap role as effectively. Uh, so until such time that that technology is commercially available, the 100% carbon-free does give us pause. I think we're all hopeful and optimistic that that technology will be developed, but I can't look you in the eye today and say that that's in place now. On the renewable energy standard, we believe the policymakers should have all the necessary information related to the cost and the timing of the transmission system upgrades before setting a revised standard. Conducting the appropriate studies are, is not meant to be a barrier to achieving public policy goals, but a necessary step to inform the process on the best, most cost-effective way to reach those goals. Uh, we talked this morning that interconnecting more of the grids across the country could help deal with the intermittent issue of renewables, and I think that's true. But we also know that building transmission can be disruptive and, and expensive, so we want to do that right. Wind energy in particular is an attractive resource at this particular point in time. We're concerned that a mandate may serve to make it more expensive to do what economics are already driving us to do. In closing, we're committed to being a partner in meeting the state's energy policy objectives and look, look forward to working with all stakeholders to quickly, reliably, and cost-effectively meet those public policy goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rick Evans and then Joe Pereira. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Rick Evans. I'm with XL Energy. Uh, as many people here know and has been referred to earlier in the testimony, uh, a couple of months ago our CEO issued a directive to the company. Uh, the directive uh, was that we would uh, shoot for 80 percent reduction in our carbon emissions from our 2005 levels to be accomplished by 2030, and that we would have an aspirational goal uh, of reaching 100 percent carbon-free by 2050. Uh, that was a press release and it was in the newspaper, but to our company, it's quite a bit more than that. This is a directive from the boss of 12,000 employees working in eight states across the United States that this is a goal that is expected to be achieved. And it is now the directive of all of the employees of XL Energy to help achieve this. Uh, as I think you, could, you can understand from some of the testimony today and Mr. O'Connell's study that he talked about this morning, this is not an easy thing to do. It is not an uncomplicated thing to do. In fact, it's a very complicated thing to do. Fortunately, here in Minnesota, we have a perfect tool for accomplishing something complicated like this. It's called the Integrated Resource Plan. It's a, it's a study, much like Mr. O'Connell's, except it's done by the utility specifically for the uh, design of the uh, infrastructure that we have, and it's updated every two years. It is an extensive project, uh, process that incorporates science, engineering, very sophisticated computer modeling. It also involves projecting costs, projecting load, how much our customers are going to demand, projecting changes in technology, projecting what public policy will be uh, coming into the future. In July of this year, we will file our latest resource plan. That will just be the beginning of the process. Then we'll go through a 12 to 18 month process 
where the experts of the Public Utilities Commission, the Office of the Attorney General, the Department of Commerce, and all of the uh, other people who, the stakeholders, environmental groups and what have you, will be able to engage in a very public process that will examine in a great deal of detail this uh, process that's been laid out in our resource plan. That's the process that will determine the most effective way to implement the goal that our CEO has set for us. And it is very unlikely that it's going to match the specific numbers that are somewhat arbitrarily assigned to specific years for renewable energy, which is only one of the tools that will help us reach that goal. In addition, it's important to understand that sometimes the renewable energy standard could actually work against the carbon standard, or rather reaching the carbon goals. For example, under this bill, we would have to select a biomass project which emits carbon dioxide, and which, by the way, is very expensive, in lieu of a large hydro project which emits no carbon dioxide and is relatively inexpensive. We would have to select building natural gas plants, perhaps, instead of extending the life of our nuclear plants or even continuing the life of our nuclear plants. I see the amount of time, so let me just say, we understand the goal, we share the goal. Let the experts choose the tools. Thank you. Joe Pereira. And then Steve Perchoka. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joseph Pereira. I'm Regulatory Director at the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota. CUB is an independent consumer energy advocate representing residential customers and small business at the legislature, the Public Utilities Commission, and other policy-making arenas. <clears throat> I'm here today to testify in favor of House Bill HF700. In addition to the work that CUB does with policymakers across the state, CUB regularly meets with local communities and civic organizations to provide relevant and digestible information to help them understand their energy systems and the energy transition Minnesota is undergoing. Most importantly, CUB's outreach teams sit down with Minnesota families week in and week out to review their energy bills, assist them in understanding their energy use, and help them find ways to control how they pay for energy. In our work with Minnesota households, we hear a lot about people's perspectives on energy. Most of these comments revolve around challenges paying bills, how to read their utility bill, how to make their house left dra less drafty, and what does the future hold for energy in our state. Overwhelmingly, we hear from customers across the state that they want cleaner, more carbon-free energy. The pathway to 100% legislation is a bold step toward addressing these concerns, the concerns of these households. It's a big step in protecting Minnesota for our clients. For many years, Minnesota was known nationwide as a leader in clean energy. The pathway legislation is a chance for our state to again reaffirm this leadership. At CUB, our work centers around saving customers money and advocating for customer-centered policy. This legislation does that. The bill sets up achievable goals without creating unnecessary burdens on consumers. The bill is appropriately flexible, allowing for off-ramps should customers or reliability be negatively affected. The bill protects workers, strengthens communities, and creates an energy economy that includes everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee and the, sponsor of the sponsors of this bill for providing leadership, creating achievable goals, and moving forward an energy vision in the interest of consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Virchota, <coughs> and then followed by Bree Halverson. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, committee. Um, I'm here to represent the Minnesota Resource Recovery Association. Um, it's a group of eight waste energy facilities that are currently operating in Minnesota. Um, I'm here to address um, specifically the part of the bill uh, that, uh, that there's a change in the definition of biomass under the new legislation. 
Um, in general, the, the uh, Minnesota Resource Recovery Association supports the general language and supports a uh, more carbon-free uh, uh, generation in the future. Um, our concern is that the wording of this bill specifically excludes um, waste to energy from being allowed <clears throat> under the eligible energy technologies um, while allowing um, landfill gas generation. Um, this bill is picking winners and losers in technology and by choosing what technology is allowed uh, to fill these new requirements, um, they're causing some issues. Uh, this bill would cause issues directly with our industry. On the federal level, waste energy is in included um, in the definition of renewable energy, along with Minnesota and 30 other states that included in their re definition. <clears throat> As a main part of this legislation, um, it's, uh, it's trying to move towards carbon-free uh, generation by 2050. Um, the US EPA uh, defines that uh, from MSW, every ton of MSW uh, that's burned in a waste energy plant actually reduces overall greenhouse gas emissions by every uh, one ton for every ton of MSW burned. Between now and 2050, waste energy can be an important part energy, <clears throat> as an energy partner to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while providing reliable base load uh, renewable energy. By definition, renewable energy is defined as something that's locally sourced and sustainable. Um, if you think about garbage, uh, it's local and um, under the most optimistic conditions of advanced recycling and material re reuse, society will continue to generate some waste. It's important to look at this waste as a resource instead of something that should be piled up into a landfill. <clears throat> energy sales uh, are used to offset the tipping fees and allow waste energy plants to be competitive with uh, landfills. <clears throat> um, this is critical in keeping the cost of uh, treating MSW uh, at a reasonable level. And uh, case uh, 3M in my area from Alexandria was allowed to expand their operations specifically because they were powered by re renewable energy from our facility. If that wasn't allowed, that plant would have left Minnesota and probably United States for production. In closing, I just want to say we are in general support of the bill and uh, think that uh, it's critical that waste energy is considered a partner as we head to a, a more uh, greener and uh, uh, carbon reduced generation. Thank you. Thank you. Bree Halverson and then Don Arnosti. Thank you, Chair Wiginius. Um, and committee um, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Brie Halverson, and I'm the regional uh, program manager for the Blue Green Alliance. The Blue Green Alliance is a national partnership headquartered here in Minnesota that brings together America's largest labor unions and most influential environmental organizations to turn today's environmental challenges, including climate change, into job creating economic opportunities. At the heart of this partnership is a firm conviction that Americans do not have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment or a safe climate. We believe that we can and must have both. The world's leading scientific organizations have been uh, unambiguous that climate change is a dire and urgent threat, and that the, lower we, the longer we delay, the stronger the action required. Simultaneously, we believe that there is a significant opportunity to create good paying jobs in this state while adopting smart solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. BGA supports the expansion of clean energy and believe any policies that expand clean energy must also include provisions to ensure that jobs created are good paying local jobs. We wanna thank Representative Long for putting forth a bill that includes language highlighting the needs of workers currently employed in the fossil fuel energy plants, as well as workers who will be employed in the clean energy economy going forward. It is vital to put in place policies and incentives to ensure the quality of jobs created as a result of an increase in carbon-free energy. In addition, it is equally vital that workers and communities impacted by the shutdown of fossil fuel plants are not left behind. We look forward to working with the, uh, the committee and Representative Long to strengthen provisions in this bill that speak to these critical stakeholders. We appreciate that Chair Wigenius and leaders in, this, in the Minnesota House of Representatives take seriously climate crisis we face. We also want to extend our appreciation to leaders like Representative Long, whom are pushing for solutions that will both reduce emissions and create investment, opportunity, quality jobs in communities throughout our state. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Nosti and then Dave McNary. 
Hello, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. My name is Don Arnosti. I'm the executive director of the Isaac Walton League. We had hoped to have our legislative intern, Sydney Anderson, testify, but she's a student at the university and had to go to her lab course this evening. Um, I'll try to speak for her. I, the Isaac Walton League is a 97-year young organization, and our younger members particularly are very concerned about their future on this planet and what's happening. Um, House File 700 is a pathway bill to where we need to get. It's a modest bill. It's not uh, proceeding as rapidly as we actually need to do to safeguard the future of the younger members of our society and some of those who are not yet born. Um, we recognize this is an important direction and thank uh, Representative Long for introducing the bill. Um, we, we believe that it's appropriate to recognize that burning garbage is not a sustainable technology at, because there's, uh, we, we need to do other things to address climate change, including reducing what is considered waste in society. And for that matter, nor is landfill gas, as the previous testifier pointed out. Thank you for Section 5, Subdivision 9, which does recognize local benefits and try to uh, support workers' rights and health, and make sure that there's equity and access to people of all incomes for renewable energy. Many testifiers have said that uh, we don't quite know how to get there, that some of these uh, goals are uh, ambitious and they're not quite sure exactly how to accomplish it. Well, I would remind all of us that when President Kennedy said we should reach the moon in less than a decade, nobody knew how to do that either. This is our generation's moonshot, and I would say it's more important than that generation's uh, moonshot. It is more important that we get this right, and we're embarking on this effort. This bill allows appropriate off-ramps and opportunities for problems that we may get into as we move towards this goal, and I think it's uh, something that we urge the committee and the legislature to pass. It's our belief that actually we're gonna be revisiting this policy in a few years because we don't believe that the goals are aggressive enough to do what climate change demands of us, but it is a good start and it's something that we must begin. And our regulated utilities in exchange for their monopoly business have accepted that regulation is part of their business plan. It's very appropriate for the legislature to set this kind of direction. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Dave McNary, and then uh, Victoria Reinhardt. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to testify. David McNary, Assistant Director, Hennepin County Environment and Energy Department. In 2007, the Hennepin County Board adopted greenhouse gas reduction goals of 80% by 2050. The county believes that the broad goals of this bill are consistent with goals shared by the county. We understand a goal of this bill is to create carbon-free electricity to help reduce climate change. An unintended consequence may result in increased methane production, a greenhouse gas far more potent than carbon. Actions that result in landfilling more garbage and consequently releasing more methane to the atmosphere will exasperate climate change from waste, not reduce it. Hennepin has committed significant public investment to manage waste and serve the Minneapolis downtown electric load and steam to district heating and cooling. Our facility business model includes owning renewable energy credits, which this bill eliminates. By law, counties oversee municipal solid waste management. Hennepin's strategy to recycle 75% of waste by 2030 reduces waste at the source, pushes recycling, establishes commercial organics composting, and minimizes landfilling as much as possible. Hennepin County takes seriously climate change mitigation and adaptation. When we installed a 96 kilowatt solar PV in 2009, it was the largest PV array in Minnesota. Consistent with that innovation, we now operate the largest gravel bed tree nursery in the state, 
growing resilient trees for public lands. 10% of electricity powering county libraries and service centers is now generated by community solar gardens, which equals 6.3 million kilowatt hours annually. By, prior, by prioritizing conservation, we cut energy use by 3% year over year for the past four years. And we've now reduced greenhouse gas emissions from operations by 25%, exceeding the county board's Cool County Pledge. Hennepin County supports legislative efforts to mitigate climate change and help local governments adopt meaningful adaptation strategies. We urge you to work with us to fully achieve that potential in the pursuit of sound solid waste management policy. We respectfully request you remove the strikeout from lines 1.20 to 1.22 of HF 700. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. My name is Victoria Reinhardt. I am on the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners and I'm chair of the Partnership on Waste and Energy, which is a joint powers board with Hennepin, Ramsey, and Washington counties. And Dave did a great job of going over some of the, the basics of what we are trying to do as counties. I just have to say that although we, I am here to speak in favor and support the goals of this legislation, I need to bring up a county concern um, that we have with the change to the definition of biomass, which eliminates energy recovery from waste. Um, the state has mandated counties to be responsible uh, for waste management, and we strongly support the waste management hierarchy, both in our actions and in what we are, our plans are for the future. <coughs> we put waste reduction, reuse, and recycling ahead of processing and landfilling. We were among the first counties in the state to implement curbside recycling in all our communities, among the first to establish recycling sites for yard waste, and have created extensive programs for business recycling. The result is that the recycling rates in our counties are among the highest in the state. Second, uh, resource recovery facilities are at the nexus of two important state policies advancing renewable energy and managing waste in an environmentally responsible manner. They really can't be viewed solely through one lens. While generating electricity from significant volumes of waste, these facilities also are important in reducing greenhouse gases when they divert waste from landfills. Finally, at the local level, the proposed legislation could stop planned innovations in their tracks. Ramsey and Washington counties recently purchased the Ramsey Washington County Recycling and Energy Center. The facility processes 450,000 tons of waste per year, recovers metals for recycling, and produces refuse derived fuel that is used at Excel Energy for electricity. That is old technology. Our plans in owning and operating this facility are to enhance the system to recover more value from trash, which means sorting recyclables beyond metals and sending RDF to a privately owned gasification technology to recover biofuels from RDF, which is carbon free. Our plans include expanding recycling of organic waste to all households in the two counties and continuing to strongly pursue separation of organics by businesses through our biz recycling program. So I'm going to skip to the final end here, and that is by defining RDF as non-renewable, we believe that this legislation could halt our plans to move forward with developing the market for RDF biofuels. We are planning, we know that XL is going to be going carbon-free in electrical generation, which is why we are vigorously pursuing gasification from the RDF rather than burning it. Um, you have to wonder where is the waste going to go if it doesn't, uh, we don't want it to go into landfills. And so what we really want to do is to deal with it in, and value the recyclable materials and so that they are not lost as well. Finally, I look forward to addressing county concerns with the proponents of this bill, Representative Long and members of this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we ha would have a representative of Labor's International Union of North America and then uh, Max J. Dixon. Max J. Dixon.
to you. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Long, and all the sponsors of this bill for your leadership on this issue. Um, my name is Max J. Dixon. I'm a Twin Cities native living in South Minneapolis. I'm here as a volunteer leader with the CR Club today. Uh, there are a number of us that you've heard from today, and I'm also glad to be able to represent the voices of the many others who aren't in the room here but are nonetheless enthusiastically supporting this bill. Um, I grew up here in Minnesota, but I've spent much of my career on the Gulf Coast in Louisiana and Florida. And while living there, I watched extreme weather events ravage the communities that I was in. I worked my way through school at a small Creole restaurant in the French Quarter of New Orleans, run by this sweet little old Creole family, the Oliviers, who had run their business for 40 years. And after watching the damage caused by storms and by the BP oil disaster, uh, they had to close their business after uh, 40 long years. I, I know that you uh, have heard from numerous experts since the beginning of the session who have warned you that the impacts of climate change are coming here to Minnesota uh, and have warned you about the ways that those will be felt in our community and by our farmers and businesses in the years to come. I'm supporting this bill because I believe that it recognizes the stark reality of the situation that we face and proposes a bold action to move us into the clean energy future that we need. I am particularly glad to see that the bill includes language to ensure that these benefits of the energy transition are shared equitably and by all Minnesotans, especially historically marginalized communities. I personally moved home to Minnesota because uh, with my fiance, we hope to someday raise our kids in the same beautiful state that I grew up in. I believe this bill is a strong step towards making sure that that future remains a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Mueller. Lauren Schulthurst, of course. Oh, is Alan Mueller? I don't think so. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lauren Schothorst, and I serve as the Energy Policy Director for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. The Minnesota Chamber represents 2,300 employers of every size and over 500,000 employees in every industry across the state. It is important to point out that our members in each and every sector are diligently working and innovating to make their products, processes, systems, and infrastructure cleaner and more efficient including the energy intensive sectors that power our state's economy. As you contemplate these changes, I appreciate the opportunity to share the Chamber's energy policy priority, maintaining reliable, cost-effective power at competitive prices for Minnesota businesses. In a competitive global economy, cost considerations across all business inputs impacts Minnesota companies' ability to succeed or grow, including energy affordability and reliability. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, Minnesota's electric rates over the past 20 years have increased faster than the U.S. average in inflation, and today we rank 20 highest for commercial and 15th highest for industrial rates in the nation. To power our state, our members support strategies that consider all of the energy resources, efficiencies, and emerging opportunities available, as long as those strategies result in cost-effective power, competitive rates, ensure energy system reliability, and do not shift costs to others. Given current market dynamics and increasingly competitive costs for renewable energy, the state can achieve its renewable energy policy goals without imposing additional mandates. And more and more companies are voluntarily reducing their environmental impacts in response to consumer preferences. Finally, we encourage all stakeholders to note that higher power rates in Minnesota force some of our companies to shift production to places with lower costs but have higher environmental impacts. In closing, Minnesota's energy policy must benefit every sector of Minnesota's economy. We believe that we can enable businesses to obtain com competitively priced, reliable power while minimizing environmental impacts and advancing innovation in Minnesota's energy industries. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to share this perspective with your committee today. Thank you so much. Uh, Rose Thielen.
Hello, my name is Rose Thielen, and I'm with, I have with me Liam McCormick, because as I think about this issue, I don't really know what's going to get through to people, particularly those who are not inclined to do something about the crisis that's in front of us. I went up to Duluth last weekend, and I was like, oh my god, there's winter. You know, this is what it used to be like in central Minnesota, and I envisioned a day when we'd all be going up to Duluth maybe for the weekend or a couple, for a week during the winter, just to experience what winter used to be like. And so what will it take to have uh, people do what they can? If we have the will, we'll find the skill, right? There's, we, it's 2045, but then we'll be able to get there. But like I say, you look at me and you probably go, oh, we know what she's going to say, and we're going to have all our arguments against her. So I wanted to give a chance to somebody who probably knows more than any of us in the room about why it's so important. So Liam, have at him. Um, so, I'm growing up in a world where I see all these things, like I see these species that might be extinct in 20 years, and I see these forests that are being depleted, and I think, I don't want to lose these things. It's not you that's going to be affected by this. It's not any of you. It's going to be me and my generation. Like, no one here is going to be affected by this. So I want you to think about not how this could help our economy now or what could help the people now, but how do we plan for the future and not be penny-wise, pound-foolish. I want to see the endangered species come back, and I want to live in a world where I can walk in the forest and not just live in an everlasting desert and have the ice caps just be a distant memory. I want to live in a world without climate change. So please do something. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Maura Walsh and then M Amelia Gonzalez Alvos. Hi, thanks for this chance to speak. My name is Moira Walsh. I'm from St. Cloud. I never paid much attention to environmental issues. It just really wasn't my thing. I don't like the outside. I figured the tree huggers had it covered, and I was more concerned about global poverty. So I, I trained for that, and I was very lucky to get a chance to work as a humanitarian aid worker in Asia and Africa for five years, but over time it became clear to me that it's the global poor that are going to bear the brunt of climate change, and that's climate change that we created by cranking carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere, you know, as an expression of our wealth. And the injustice of that really embarrasses me. And add to it that climate change is driving an increase in refugees globally at the same time that the wealthiest countries are shying from their responsibilities to accept refugees. And I find that just something that I know that we can do better, something that we can address here in Minnesota. The state is a leader. And I hope that we decide to step forward and, and lead the lesser states with our, our newer, higher goal and um, bringing our experts along with us all the way. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Amelia Gonzalez Alvarez and then Sean Chigalski. Uh, 
Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emilia Gonzalez Avalos. I am the Executive Director of an organization called Unidos Minnesota. And uh, we're an organization that centers community organizing in the Latino community. And our constituency uh, basically lives within uh, Minneapolis and Poland, the metro area, and also in uh, concentrated parts in uh, southern Minnesota. So to be specific, Worthington, St. James, St. Peter, Mankato, um, Austin, Rochester. And um, I'm here to share uh, two aspects of uh, this work and why we're supporting this bill. One is the professional aspect. Um, as you may know, the Latinx community is relatively young. Uh, most of the, the population is under 35 years old and a little bit over 20 uh, years old. That's the big bulk of the Latino community. Most of them are voters. And when we have surveyed our uh, folks across the state during our public assemblies, uh, environmental and climate change, environmental issues and climate change are one of the top three issues that the Latinx community thinks about when, in com when it comes with, um, when they're civically engaged. So this is a very important issue for our community across the board. Um, so on the other hand, on the personal uh, side of, of my testimony, I am, uh, I am an immigrant. I was born in Mexico City. And through history, we've known that immigration has been fueled by either wanting to get an opportunity, uh, escaping poverty, escaping civil unrest. But l lately, climate change is one of the reasons why people are being pushed out of their countries of origin and their na native lands. Um, the other thing is that um, as an immigrant myself, uh, I came to this country when I was a child, and the same is with my husband. He came to this country after becoming an orphan when he was 10 years old. And not only he has called Minnesota home for many years, he's almost 40, but he also went back to school to finish his degree on green and renewable energy from Century College. So this is an issue that he cares deeply about. Uh, and he decided to make this change of career because he developed severe asthma and severe allergies to the point where his lungs were very close of collapsing and he had to request many days of work. Uh, that, you know, as, as I hear conversation about the cost of utilities, uh, perhaps we also should talk about the cost of medical bills because of these conditions that are causing uh, generational changes in, in our livelihoods. This is a sickness that we've never had in our family history. So, um, and then um, this, my testimony was, um, it was changed last minute because actually my daughter, who's nine, was supposed to be here and testify with me, but she's on the other side of the river because of the snowstorm. So if Madam Chair allows me, I would like to tape a very quick recording of her from Minneapolis right now. Will that be okay? Will that be okay? So um, my daughter was going to be here with me and share her testimony, but she couldn't because of the snow uh, after school. So I wonder if I'm allowed to play a very short, less than a 30 seconds recording of her talking about this issue. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we have two more testifiers, uh, Sean Sergalski and then Mayor Fry. Hello, um, Chair Wiginius and um, representatives. Thanks so much for having me come in. I'm Sean Gusheski, the Director of the Alliance for Sustainability. And over the last three years, <coughs> we've been helping 40 cities to work on their energy goals for their new 20-year comprehensive plans, and they're excited to get them done. So by having uh, more rapid progress toward renewable energy, cities will be able to meet their renewable energy goals. Um, and we see have Mayor Fry right here. We, they, a lot of it's right in the comp plan with uh, Minneapolis comp plan. So um, a couple of the areas that we'd love to have you guys work on is ensuring as we move toward a green grid that we also have distributed generation 
I know a lot of cities have a lot of businesses that could benefit from solar. Uh, with uh, all these federal tax credits, they can get solar on their buildings at a very low cost. Uh, also by, you know, working on the smart grid investments so we can uh, make, take advantage of uh, turning off demand. Um, one of the exciting things is cities are also working on electrifying their transportation. Uh, for example, Minneapolis is working on electric vehicle hubs, uh, and Rosemont actually worked with a developer to have a 100-home subdivision that has the correct wiring in their garages to have electric vehicles. So this will help generate more electricity um, sales at night with wind power, which will help create uh, lower rates for the overall rate base. Um, one of the things we'd like to show, have you also work on is companion bills related to job training and research so that all parts of the state can benefit from uh, low, you know, very high energy efficient building construction, new type of building materials with panelized construction, um, looking at energy storage, um, and like DigiKey is building components for the smart grid. So we want to work with all the regional development agencies to have their community colleges have, you know, job training that would relate to that. And then um, I know that a lot of cities would be concerned about anything that would cause any of the uh, resource recovery facility to shut down. We do have the Elk River plant just shut down and it, it's going to cause a problem for maybe more landfilling. So try to do what you can to keep uh, you know, we're going to reduce waste as fast as we can, but also figure out how to keep the resource facilities going um, when they need to. And then my daughter couldn't make it here because she has lifeguard training at the Y, but she uh, saw that picture in the Star Trib with the entire page of brown where we couldn't have forests in the state. So she wanted me to talk about her concern. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Fry. Uh, you are our last testifier, so you may put on the exclamation point. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, I, I do appreciate you hearing my, my testimony for today, and I'm also appreciative that I was able to go last, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't have made it on time. It took something like 90 minutes to get from Minneapolis City Hall to this location, and I think that's underestimating. Uh, so now is, now is the time. Now is the time for us to move forward with 100% uh, clean uh, and equitable energy that benefits Minnesotans, starting with 100% clean and renewable electricity. Uh, Minnesota has made strong progress on moving away from coal and investing in wind, solar, and energy savings. And in fact, Minnesota has been at the forefront of many of these significant initiatives throughout history, so I see this one as no different. Uh, we do have the potential to move dr dramatically towards renewable mechanisms that will benefit our environment, and I think that we should be setting goals in doing so. Uh, by setting those clear and tangible and reachable goals by 2050, which is still some time away, uh, we set the target that we can either meet and even exceed. Uh, but at the very least, setting the goal, I think, lays the foundation for the uh, legislation that I think needs to move forward uh, and encourages the private sector to follow suit. Uh, Minneapolis took a significant step uh, just this last year by setting a community-wide standard of 100% renewable electricity by 2030, uh, but emissions are not uh, contained to a set geography. Uh, these emissions obviously are, are going to the entire state. Uh, and so I also believe in building on some of the economic benefit uh, that we've seen right now. Nearly 60,000 Minnesotans are now employed in the clean energy uh, and efficiency sector. That number is just going dramatically up right now. If you combine uh, clean energy jobs with tech jobs, those are far and away the, the fastest growing sectors that we have right now. And they're sectors that we should be investing in uh, and sectors that we should be getting behind. Uh, moving to 100% clean energy can and should benefit everyone. Uh, every year we spend, uh, we send billions of dollars out of state to pay for our energy, uh, for coal, for oil, uh, and for gas, and we should be investing those dollars to create a pathway for new jobs, sustainable careers, and a high quality of life. And so this policy, and I do appreciate Representative Long's work on it, would expand the growing energy jobs in Minnesota while advancing vocational training 
job and economic opportunities for low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, during this transition, we need to find ways to strengthen all communities that are impacted by the transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, and we do need bold action on climate change. And uh, I, I like to think that the city of Minneapolis is taking really aggressive measures to, to target it. The, just before me, the speaker mentioned our 2040 comprehensive plan, which has uh, renewable energy as a real focal point uh, and ensures that people ha can live within proximity of their jobs. It ensures that uh, renewable and sustainable sources are valued over the traditional mechanisms. Uh, and we would love to partner with the state of Minnesota. Uh, I'll just finish by saying uh, we need bold action. We need some serious bold action on climate change. It was uh, my, uh, it was actually a student that was that I was mentioning to the other day. I said, you know, the uh, the first person uh, to die of climate change has already been born. Uh, and she corrected me and says, uh, Mr. Mayor, I apologize. The first person to die of a climate change is already dead. Uh, they're right, we've got a lot of work to do, and I very much look forward to partnering with the state in doing so. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you so members. much for your trip. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Long, your final word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, thank you so much for this informational hearing. For um, the members, thank you for, for staying uh, for the second round of testimony. We had 48 uh, Minnesotans come to talk on this really important issue, and I think uh, heard a lot of great perspectives and asked a lot of great questions. So looking forward to working with this committee on this important issue and really grateful for the time uh, and for, I think, taking a really important first step in talking about what's possible on clean energy in Minnesota. Thank you. With that, members, this is a joke.